Developing Metro 2033 had been challenging for 4A games. After splintering from GSC Game World in 2005, the Ukrainian studio had spent the better half of the decade building everything in their first title from the ground up. From the engine that powered its world, to the design philosophy that informed its gameplay. And while the game had managed to exceed expectations when it finally released, it also carried with it a stigma of being undercooked on account of its many bugs and occasionally infuriating enemy AI. With 2033's sequel, 4A had an opportunity to enjoy a much smoother development cycle. Most of the fundamentals upon which it would be built were already in place, and THQ, which had served as the first game's publisher, was eager to provide the studio with much more support than in the past. Unfortunately, like a journey through the tunnels of Moscow's metro system gone awry, the game's development would be beset by various struggles. Some intrinsic to 4A, others created by events far beyond its control. Yet 4A would proceed to not only weather these issues, but ultimately release a sequel that rivaled and, in some ways, surpassed the quality of its predecessor. To onlookers within the industry, what they managed to accomplish was nothing short of incredible. But to the studio's employees, it was just part of the job. This is the history of Metro Last Light. Less than four months after Metro 2033's release, THQ's Danny Bilson would reveal that a continuation of Foray's underground hit was in production, and that it would be called Metro 2034. To players abroad, the follow-up's title seemed to suggest it would adapt the contents of Dmitry Glukovsky's sequel novel of the same name, which the author had just published in Russia the year prior. Glukovsky, however, didn't believe that this would be a good idea. While the author's second novel had been well received in his home country, it was very different than what had come before it. Where Metro 2033 had been a relatively straightforward adventure story, Metro 2034 was more of an esoteric thriller, with little in the way of action and an almost entirely different cast of characters. From his perspective, its contents would be much more difficult to translate into a compelling gameplay experience, let alone one that would feel like a natural continuation of Foray's first outing. As a result, it was decided early on that the next Metro video game would feature a completely new story, one that Glukovsky himself would spend a sizable amount of time hashing out alone, before handing it off to 4A, and that this new story, in turn, called for 4A's game to receive a new title, Metro Last Light. As Last Light made the rounds at electronic entertainment expos and preview events, it seemed like 4A was on their way to building a much bigger and better experience than what they'd previously offered. In addition to looking even more graphically impressive than its predecessor, which itself had already dazzled players when it was first released, representatives of the studio were quick to highlight the many ways in which Last Light's gameplay would improve upon its predecessor's deficits. The game's web of mechanics would be explained in a more user-friendly fashion, shooting would feel more impactful, and stealth, a sore spot for many 2033 players, would be significantly easier to perform. And better yet, it appeared as if 4A was implementing all of these changes under much less strained circumstances than before, with brand manager Hugh Bynan revealing in a 2012 interview with Oz Gamers that the studio had expanded from 50 to 80 members for the sequel's development, and now had the full support of THQ behind them. While THQ had previously published 2033, they only signed on to do so less than a year before it released, and didn't recognize its level of caliber until it had become an unexpected hit. With Last Light, the publisher was determined to do right by it and make sure it received the polish and marketing push the game before it never got. It also didn't hurt that Last Light was set to grace more platforms than its predecessor, with 4A confirming early on that the game would release on the PC, Xbox 360, and PlayStation 3 this time around. A Wii U version of the game was also briefly considered before being cancelled due to 4A finding its hardware to be inadequate. But given the Nintendo console's low market penetration, as well as how poorly other third-party games typically performed on it, this decision was likely for the best. Do we have 
Hatfield, and this is IGN News. THQ, publisher of games like Saints Row and WWE, is bankrupt and auctioning off its assets. The new homes of THQ franchises are slowly being revealed. Koch Media, Ubisoft, and Sega are among the new owners of THQ's intellectual property and studios. But then, just as Last Light was about to enter the final stages of its development, THQ would declare bankruptcy. After enjoying nearly two decades of growth and acquisitions, the publishing giant had become worn down in the early 2010s by a mix of bad business decisions, shifts in the audiences it developed games for, and expensive bets that failed to bear fruit, such as Udraw, a gaming tablet peripheral that had sold disastrously. These complications hadn't been enough to stop THQ from continuing to support Last Light, with the publisher repeatedly highlighting the shooter alongside titles like Evolve and Saints Row 4 as one of the games that it believed would help buoy it back into the black during its final months. But they ultimately proved too difficult to fully recover from. And in January of 2013, THQ would auction off its remaining studios and assets, with the publishing rights to the Metro series ending up in the hands of Deep Silver. While Foray was ultimately able to continue working on Last Light uninterrupted, this unexpected turn of events was still very challenging for the studio, due in no small part to how close the game was to completion when it happened. It also resulted in Foray losing out on an opportunity to create what could have been a truly unique new property, with Danny Bilson revealing in a 2013 interview with Edge Magazine that plans were in motion to have the studio develop Deep Six, an underwater shooter set decades after aquatic aliens have flooded the Earth and enslaved most of humanity. According to Bilson, 4A was being eyed to develop it once they completed their second Metro game, and that when things turned south for the publisher, these plans were nixed. But perhaps most significantly, THQ's downfall resulted in the harshness of 4A's working conditions being brought to light. During its final year, THQ had brought on Naughty Dog co-founder Jason Rubin as its new president, in an effort to try and turn around its sagging fortunes. Despite the considerable odds stacked against him, Rubin made a point of visiting and familiarizing himself with all of the studios the publisher was partnered with during this period, including 4A. And what he learned about 4A would lead him to publish a tell-all article about it on GamesIndustry.biz a day after Last Light's release. According to the article, the Kiev-based developer endured hardships unknown to most other video game studios. In addition to being severely cramped, its office experienced frequent and lengthy power outages suffered from unreliable winter heating, and lacked easy access to essential electronics, with high-end PCs and game development kits needing to be snuck into the country in order to avoid being unfairly seized at the border. 4A had it rough, and the fact that it managed to make games that were just as good, if not better, than studios that worked in far better circumstances than it, spoke immeasurably to its employees' tenacity and skill. Rubin's article also revealed that THQ had pushed 4A early on to include cooperative and competitive multiplayer modes in Last Light within the same time and budget it had been given to complete its main campaign. Both parties had previously mentioned several times during the game's development that a multiplayer component of some sort was being worked on, but that it wasn't a major priority, with 4A eventually announcing in October of 2012 that it had been discontinued outright so that it could focus more on Last Light's single-player campaign. However, up until it was abandoned, both sides had indicated that it was something 4A had been personally motivated to try and create, whereas Rubin's article characterized it as something that was forced upon the studio and without the promise of additional financial compensation. In a statement issued to Polygon shortly after the publication of the piece, 4A's Andrew Prokhorov would express his support for Rubin, noting that he had been the first and only THQ president to ever visit their office in person and that his expose on its less than perfect working conditions was appreciated. However, he would argue that even though it wasn't the best, one got used to the drawbacks of working at their office, describing it as ultimately having a fun and friendly atmosphere. Prokhorov would also contest Rubin's implications that they had been forced into creating a multiplayer mode in a comment on his article, claiming that while it ultimately ended up being a waste of time, it was something that the studio itself had wanted to include. From 4A's perspective, Having good working conditions was important, but even more important was that fans and critics alike evaluated their games based on their merits and not on the circumstances in which they had been made. Whether this was fair remains up for debate. What wasn't up for debate, however, was that when Metro Last Light launched in May of 2013 on the PC, PlayStation 3, and Xbox 360, 
It represented the studio's most refined offering yet. Set one year after the events of 2033, Last Light's story saw Archim embark on yet another odyssey across Moscow's irradiated remains, this time on a quest to rescue an infantile Dark One and prevent his world from becoming engulfed in an all-out war. While largely identical to 2033 in terms of atmosphere and mechanics, Last Light distinguished itself from its predecessor and appeased plenty of critic, with its many adjustments to both. From allowing players to wipe their gas mask when it becomes dirtied, to customize their firearms in order to make them more effective and versatile in combat. Stealthing around enemies was significantly easier to perform. The production values on its set pieces were greater than ever, and its bugs, while still very much a part of the experience, were not as common as they had been in 2033. Not all were happy with these changes. Where some found that they allowed for a much smoother entry into the Metro universe than what had been offered with 2033, Others felt that they pushed Last Light's core gameplay too far away from what had made its predecessor so appealing. From their perspective, the degree to which 4A had made guns and stealth more powerful in Last Light severely hampered its effectiveness as a survival horror game, turning it into more of an everyday shooter than a brush with the macabre. Further aggravating was the fact that 4A had offered Ranger Mode, a hardcore difficulty option which the studio had touted as being the definitive way to experience Last Light and a potential antidote to those that found the game too easy, as a bonus solely to those who pre-ordered the game. Even with these criticisms, however, most agreed that Last Light was still a very strong title and a worthy continuation of Dmitry Glukovsky's original works, so much so that Glukovsky would later incorporate aspects of Last Light's story into his fourth novel, Metro 2035. And much to Deep Silver's satisfaction, it would go on to sell very well, too surpassing 2033's lifetime sales in the United States within a single week. During the remainder of 2013, Last Light would go on to receive a steady stream of downloadable content, with Foray releasing several standalone missions centered on Archim's many allies and adversaries, as well as a host of new weapons and tools for players to mess around with. In a series of developer blogs, Foray would explain that it was decided early on that everything the studio added to Last Light post-release would try to take advantage of the many refinements they had made to its combat mechanics and be entirely built from the ground up. Nothing from the base game was to be carved out and resold to players. While most agreed that it adhered to these criteria, reactions to this content would nonetheless be mixed. With the exception of a few missions, such as a stealth-heavy escapade in which the player assumed the role of the communist soldier Pavel, players found the design and length of these miniature adventures to be lacking, especially when compared to what had been offered in Last Light's main campaign. Much more positively received would be Metro Redux, a collection containing remastered versions of both Metro games that would release in August of 2014 on the PC, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. In addition to containing sizable graphical facelifts, both remasters would feature a bevy of changes and improvements, with the Redux version of 2033 in particular incorporating many of the mechanical and technical refinements that Foray had introduced in Last Light the year prior, as well as many of its character models and other visual assets. The remasters would also feature new difficulty modes that mirrored the other game's stylistic differences, allowing one to play through Last Light in a fashion reminiscent of 2033's more survival-oriented gameplay and vice versa. All of these additions would be applauded by pundits upon the remaster's release, with many quickly hailing Metro Redux as the definitive way to experience Foray's duology. However, some within the Metro community would express mixed feelings about the remaster's improved but much brighter lighting, finding it to detract from their comparatively dark atmospheres, especially in Metro 2033. 
Developing Redux would also prove to be one of Foray's more trying projects. With Hugh Bynan revealing in interviews ahead of its release that the studio faced extreme difficulty acquiring PlayStation 4 and Xbox One development kits during its development, a problem that only became exacerbated when the events surrounding the 2014 Ukrainian Revolution started to unfold. While the studio eventually got its hardware, and more importantly, managed to avoid personal harm in the ensuing turmoil, it was decided shortly after that Foray would move its headquarters to Malta where it would be able to obtain first-party technology and other amenities with greater ease. Und unsere beiden Geschichten sind sehr tragisch, aber wenn ihr konntet ihr Weg an die Freiheit mit ein bisschen Hilfe von In a late 2016 Reddit AMA, Lukowski would express that while he had no interest in writing any more Metro novels after 2035, he had faith that the franchise would continue, both in the form of stories penned by other authors and video games. Players didn't yet know that 4A was at that point hard at work on Metro Exodus, which would debut at E3 the following year. But even without this knowledge, there was little reason to be concerned for the series' future. With Metro Last Light, 4A had not only proved that they weren't a one-trick pony, but that its adaptations of Glukowski's novels would continue, no matter what hardships the future might hold. Our documentaries are crowdfunded and made possible by the generous supporters backing us on Patreon. If you enjoy our content, consider subscribing to our channel and becoming a patron to help us create more. Thank you. Thank you.